good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, to moms, moms at heart, moms that are to be, and so great to have you as well online, all of our locations. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jerry, by the way, I get to be the senior pastor here, so a special welcome to you as we are in a series, actually landing the series next weekend. So we're on the downward slope, and we will have gone through all of this letter called 1 John about what it means to know God. It's good to know him. It's good to know we are known by him. And to search your own hearts in terms of where our relationship is with him and each other. So let me pray. I've got a word for us today. Lord, we love you. We need you. And we pray your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. God, we need you to speak through your servant and through the scriptures. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the AI chat GPT, have you heard this? It's like the thing right now. And... I came across an article where there was a AI, artificial intelligence program, that was assigned to write an essay called, or to write an essay in which to convince us that robots come in peace for humanity. So this AI program searched all of the internet and wrote this long, pages-long essay about how Uh, We can trust that robots come in peace. But notice what it said here. I'm going to read it to you. The artificial artificial intelligence program assured readers that eradicating humanity seems like a rather useless endeavor for AI machines since people will keep doing what they've always been doing, hating and fighting each other. Hmm. So, you know, when you look at the world, you look at culture, you see a lot of that. And sadly, that can even happen inside of churches. So we have John here, Pastor John. He's been one of Jesus' 12, then one of Jesus' inner three. And now he's Pastor John. He's over 80 years old. He's still not over the love of God and how that love flows through him to his people. He loves his people. And he keeps, he keeps repeating this, this refrain of, Love and love, 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 love. And even today, we're in 15 verses, and he mentions love 27 times. So it seems to me that he's speaking to a group of people that's very much like people in our day. Maybe even you. You come from some severe wounds in your life. You're wounded. You're broken. You've been brokenhearted, betrayed, abandoned, I mean, it's Mother's Day, and this isn't really a message for mothers on Mother's Day, though it does apply in terms of love. And I would even say maybe some of you, you come from a broken home where that love wasn't there for you. And so when we hear love from John, he's speaking to a people in real time that know what it means to be hurt. And so he's calling them to to transcend to this love that he expresses here. So when we look at love, I want to look at it in a couple ways with you. First, what does John say to us? What does the scripture say to us about why we should love? And then secondly, how to love, meaning how do we find strength to love in the way that scriptures talk about here? And this love can begin with your own family, your your spouse or your ex-spouse. It could begin with your parents. It could begin also in the workplace. It, It can be all over the place of where this would apply but he's chiefly speaking to God's family, brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's see what he's got to say. Why should we love? First of all, this, your love is a witness for Christ. Your love is a witness for Christ. 1 John 4, 12 and 14, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God's love, or God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. So it's real clear, he, he says, how does, how does the world see the unseen love of God? Well, the world will see it through people loving each other, God's people loving each other. He talks about this love given, this love perfected. He's talking about a love perfected in the sense that we don't love perfectly. That's not going to happen. But there's a love perfected, meaning it's love that reaches its goal, its, its destiny, its, its fullest expression out of us toward each other. That's how we should be moving and growing to display this love of God. I was thinking of that uh, that in terms of Harley Davidson's. You know, we got some friends around here riding Harleys, and I salivate and I repent of my envy 
the best I can. But a buddy of mine was sharing, sharing his Harley with me the other day, just showing it to me. I mean, it was, it's, you know a Harley, even if, you're not, even if you don't follow motorcycles, you'll know a Harley when you see it. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's got the big Harley Davidson there on the tank. But a Harley does not reach its fullest expression until you crank it up and hear the rumble. That rumble from a Harley, you can hear a half mile away. That rumble was actually patented, trademarked by Harley Davidson in 1994. That's how unique it is. So a Harley looks wonderful, but it doesn't reach its fullest expression until you hear its rumble. So in the same way, we are loved by God and we are called to be Christians and we are to be Christians in behavior and life, but our love should be really different from what anybody else sees. And he's saying the fullest expression of the love of God must come through us with the rumble of love for one another. Jesus says in John chapter 17, he says, he says that God will know, people will know that God sent his son and that God's people are one, are unified. That's, he said that twice there. Then in John 13, John chapter 13, he says, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples by your Christian bumper stickers. Uh, no, he didn't say that. He also didn't say by this, the world will know you're my disciples by your Christian tattoos, though I love them all. But here's what he said about how the world will know. He says, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples in that you love one another. That's the chief witness is God's people loving each other. And as we inch into election season, pastors have a dread in their guts, y'all, because it becomes so divisive and so many views and so many sides and so many finger pointing and my whole, you know, and as a pastor, you're trying to hold your church together. You're trying to keep everybody focused on the, on the main thing, which is the gospel of Christ and how we are to love each other through that kind of season. And as we do, what a, what a witness it gives to the world. I came across these two authors, or two, yeah, two authors, I could say, back about 100 years after Christ was, had risen from the grave. His name is Lucian here. He's a Greek writer. He wasn't even a Christian. And watch what he said about the Christians of that day. He said, it is incredible to see the fervor with which these people of that religion, Christianity, help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their Christ has put it into their heads that they are all brothers and sisters. Then Tertullian, how's that a name for your cat in the future right there? Tertullian. Here's what he said. He was a pastor of, of, of the early church. He says, it is our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our enemies. Look, they say, how they love one another. Look how they are prepared to die for one another. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of Christians today, God's people today, the church today? Because that is the witness. Can you imagine being so melted by the love of God that we look at other believers and say, I die for you. I don't agree with you. You have a different viewpoint, but you're my brother and sister in Christ. I die for you. Who can say that? Who will say that? Only those whose heart's been melted by Christ. Dr. Tim Keller talks about the church, early church seen in the letter of Acts in the Bible. There's this city called Antioch. It was the most ethnically diverse city in the known world in that day. What was interesting about the city is cities usually have a wall around it to protect them from the outsiders, but this city had walls on the inside. And these walls separated all these different races, Assyrian, Jews, Greeks, Africans. And the thing was, these walls separate us, stay away from us, and we'll stay away from you. We don't mingle with one another. We have our own views and our own ways and our own race and our own ethnicity, and you do your thing, we'll do our thing. But then Acts chapter 11 happens. And these groups began placing their faith in Christ, melted by the love of God, and they started crossing the walls, worshiping together. And there was no name for this. So in Acts chapter 11, God's people first, you see this first phrase about God's people in Acts chapter 11, were called Christians. Christ ones. That's the only name they could they could give to what they were beholding because there are these different classes of people, ethnicities that ought to hate each other and stay away from each other, yet they are coming together to worship and call each other brother and sister. And it was a witness to the whole world. That's who we should be. 
That's what the scriptures even call us to be. He says, those who have not seen God can see God's love through our love for one another. That word see means a theater. So let me ask you a question. When people look at your life, when they look at the theater of your life, who do they see and what do they see? When your life's a theater on the train in the commute, when your life's that theater at home with your family, when your life is that theater at the ball game and the ref makes the call, oh, that convicted me this week, y'all. What is, what is the theater of your life? What do they see? Do they see love, this rumble of love reaching and growing in its fullest expression? That's who we're called to be. So why to love? We love because we're, it's a witness for Christ. Secondly, you love because it's assurance of your salvation. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And he's not saying anyone who does not love God does not know God. He's saying anyone who does not love others, each other, another, does not know God. Because again, born of him, born of God, born again. He keeps repeating this from Jesus, meaning that when you place faith in Christ, there's a seed put in you, a, a DNA, like father, like son, like father, like daughter, with this kind of love. First John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister, he, she is a liar. For he or she does not love his brother whom he or she can, has, not, has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen, or is unable to love God if there's hate in your heart or hate in my heart. Now, the good news about this, in a way, is literally the language reads this way. If anyone says, I love God and habitually loves, uh, who habitually hates, continuously hates another, and that's good news because, listen, we can't control the feelings that happen in us. I mean, when something happens to you uh, by what was said or what was done and it, it really comes at you, there's going to be hate that comes up in the heart. And you know what? As a dad, I can take a lot, but when my kids, when it comes to my kids, all right, there can be hate that comes in my heart toward another who would hurt anyone in my family or myself, just like it can in you. So what he's saying is, or what he's not saying is, there's never going to be a moment that doesn't happen to you. You can't control it. What matters is what you do with it. Will you cherish it? Will you nourish it? Will you dwell on it? Will you have this habitual hate you nurture in your heart and even use to mistreat others or be a pa passive aggressive toward those people or that person? That's what he's getting at. Three times he uses the word liar in 1 John. The first time he used it was this. He said, if you say you know God and you don't obey his commandments, you're a liar. The second time he uses a liar, he says, if you say you know God yet deny Jesus Christ in the fullness of who he is, you're a liar. And this is the third time he says it. He says, if you say you know God yet, or I love God, and yet you hate someone in your heart or the way you treat them, then that also is a lie. So the so self-deception is over for where we think we are with God when we lay it up against the scriptures here. It's easy to love. I mean, it's easy, yeah, it's easy to love when it costs us nothing. Matthew or Mark, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said in terms of loving enemies, he says, what is it if you love those who just love you? Even criminals do that. What is it if you greet those who will greet you back? He said, well, who would do that? I mean, that, that's just a natural thing of what happens. So take that very practically and then paint it in a bigger picture about loving enemies, those who won't love you back, those who don't care to love you, those who have who've betrayed you or harmed you or even has done something to your children or whatever, however that may look. He's saying that is what it means to love past that and showing that you're loving past that. You're not perfect at it. It doesn't say perfect love, but love being perfected, growing, is pushing past that that shows there's the seed of God in you, that even Jesus died on the cross, blood poured out, and yet he said, Father, forgive them. So love is love, especially when it hurts. So a thought here. I read this quote just this morning, and it stunned me, and I wrote it in my notes. Listen to this quote. This person wrote, The real test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but loving Judas. 
Oh, I didn't need that today. Anybody? What a stunning comment and what a truth to let it search your heart and mind. Your love is assurance of salvation. Thirdly, your love, my love, is commanded by God. 1 John 4, 21, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother, his sister in Christ. And you might say, but pastor, I've tried to love them. It's impossible to love them. If you only knew what I was dealing with, if you only knew, you totally understand. Listen, I feel that in you and you can love. We'll see that in just a minute, but even more so, you must love. Because I, trust me, when I looked at this word love, I went to the back of the Bible and I really started looking up if there were any exceptions to this love. Is there an asterisk somewhere around this love where there's exceptions that I don't have to love like this? Not there. So it's, we can, but we must love. And, and again, love is not, don't think of love as a feeling. You're not going to feel love for enemies. That's not going to happen. And I think it doesn't even mean you got to like your enemies. I, it just means you choose to love, meaning you choose to treat well, you choose to behave well and, and be for the benefit of and the good of those who have harmed you or those you would consider enemies. So the Apostle Paul shows us what that behavior of love would look like. First Corinthians 13, even if you're not a believer, you've probably heard of this chapter of love and you hear it often in weddings. And many people think, that crazy sounding love of 1 Corinthians 13, it's only for husbands and wives. That was not written for husbands and wives. It was written for God's people and their relationship with each other. Now, you can apply it to husbands and wives. You can apply it to family. But he's speaking to the church here. So watch this. Love is patient, Scripture says. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So how are you doing? When you look at this kind of love, do you have a love that's honorable toward others, even if it's not to your benefit, even if they don't deserve it? Do you have a love that is not easily angered? Do you keep a record of wrongs? Let us lay our lives over what it means to love as God calls us to love. Because we should love because it's a witness for Christ, it's assurance of salvation, and love is commanded by God. Now, how do we love like that? Where are we going to find the strength to love in this way? It has to be something outside of us. I need it to be outside of me because I don't have this in me. And neither do you. <laughs> I was thinking of an a, a article I read a while back. Peter Benchley is the author's name. He wrote Jaws. You know the movie Jaws? Well, he originally wrote the, the book around that. And he was asked about his love for sharks. And here's what he said. He said, you know, when it comes to shark, sharks, it's hard to care deeply for something that might turn on you and to eat you. And I thought, you could apply that to people, No. It's hard to care for people, to love people in the ways that's described here because they might turn on you and eat you. And I'm thinking most of us here, if not all of us here, we have shark bites on us, don't we? On the front and on the back. So how do we love through it in the way that's described here? Well, here's how it happens. First is to know that God enables you to love. God enables you, strengthens you to love. 1 John 4, 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, that God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So it all begins with faith. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, it begins there. The love of God comes to you through his Holy Spirit. And now you are to be at home. Don't be at home in bitterness. Don't be at home in revenge fantasies. Be at home in his love. That's what it means. Stay at home. Dwell. Ponder. Meditate. You abide by getting in God's word and getting God's word in you. Prayer. Repentance. Confession. Surrender. You abide. And that's where you're filled to be able to love. God enables you to love then. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. 
And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us, and there it is, of his spirit. So when you are born of him, you are born of God, you are born again, as John continues to, to repeat that, you were given God's DNA, chiefly his Holy Spirit, to indwell and to fill and to live through you. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the very first fruit mentioned in that place is love. Then it goes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So that is of God's spirit and for you to dwell in because you don't have enough in you to pull out of you this love. So he gives it to you. And it says this to, to show us the magnitude that God is love. Notice it doesn't say that love is God. And we live in a day, new age and so forth, that love is God. No, no, no. God is love in the same way that, you know, grass is green, but green's not grass. So God is love, but not love is God. God is, God defines what love is. So we live in a day, uh, the word love is hijacked and, you know, love is love. You'll hear this, love is love. No, it's not. Love is as defined by God. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So there could be much today called love, but if it's not according to the truth, it's not of God because love is defined by God. God is love. Love comes from God, he repeats, meaning just as the heat comes from the fire or light comes from the sun, so God's love comes through his people in this rumble for one another. So God enables you to love through his Holy Spirit and then secondly, to know that God first loved you. And that's how he enables you to love in this kind of way, that he first loved you. Even when you're shark bitten. Or, or even when, as my wife says, even when people are peoply, you're able to love in this way through his first love. 1 John 4, 9, in this the love of God was revealed, exposed, made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. I love how he amplifies this love by saying he sent his only son. The magnitude of this love. Then he says in First John, well, actually he says here too, that you might live through him. People think Jesus came so I'd stop doing wrong and start doing right. Jesus came so I'd stop being unreligious and start being religious. No, he didn't. He came to give you life. Life meaning a, a eternal life with God forever and, and joy and freedom. But life now where you experience meaning and purpose and joy that ultimately cannot be touched no matter what happens, no matter what the bite, the shark bite happens in your life. It can't be touched. And this love that sets you free. This is what he brings. 1 John 4.10, now this is going to sound familiar if you've been here for any amount of time. It's my favorite text in all of Scripture. It, 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 it gloriously ruined my life. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the reason that moves me is I have two sons. And I can't imagine that kind of love, that God would send his son in the form of Christ to die for our sins. This love, I mean, it's one, one author said, we are, we are more wicked than we could ever imagine, yet we are more loved than we could ever dare dream. Someone only pays for some... Let me see how to say that more rightly. Uh, something's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And Christ paid it all. Propitiation. I, I, I threw a curveball with that word today, didn't I? The word is atoning sacrifice. And here's the picture of what, it, what that epic word means. That God is white, hot, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah chapter 6, white, hot, holy, roaring, 
in, in his holiness. And no sin, no human can be in his presence without being extinguished. So if God is white, hot, holy, that means there's the roar of wrath from his holiness towards sin. That's how he's God. So therefore, God can't look at sinners who by nature resist and rebel against him or come up with our own version of him. He can't just overlook it and act like everything's okay and I forgive you anyway. No judge would do that to someone who committed a capital crime. The judge would not be just in doing so. So in the same way, God would not be just just saying, now you're forgiven, going about your life and do better. No, something has to give. Something has to give where God is white, hot, holy, wrath against sin. Yet somehow in the same way, he loves us and wants us to be with him. Something has to happen, and it did happen, and his name is Jesus. So Jesus came for the joy set before him, goes to the cross, took on that sin that cannot be in the presence of God. And when he took on that sin, all that roaring, white-hot holiness of God, wrath poured out on him, paying the penalty for our sin. And then he dies, and on the third day, he rose from the grave. Now, there's no fear of the holy wrath of God. Now we have the lap of God, God the Father, and we are called sons and daughters of God. That's what that word means. Let me give you a picture. See if this helps. Picture a wildfire in California, roaring, disintegrating, eating, destroying everything in its path by, the, by just its fire. It's what a fire does. Roaring wildfire spanning tens of thousands of acres and the wind blowing it 120 miles per hour. Can you imagine that coming at you at 120 miles per hour? So here's this roaring fire coming at 120 miles per hour. There's no way you can outrun it. God's holiness is like this roaring fire moving at 120 miles an hour surrounding our lives. And it doesn't matter how fast you can run or how high you can jump. You will never outrun that fire. In the same way with God's holiness, you can never be good enough. You can never act right enough. You can never be religious enough to, get to, to escape. So as that roaring holiness comes for our sin, Jesus steps in between us. And all that roaring wildfire holiness, thousands of acres, 120 miles per hour, all funnels into one direction upon Christ. And he takes it for the joy set before him. He dies, he rises up, and now the wrath, holiness of God is satisfied and we are made the children of God. Think of it. John took time to talk about that in his letter because it meant the world to him. And he's unlocking the secret of what it means to be so loved by God that it would melt our hearts to love radically his people and those who are indeed unlovable. So God loved you first. That's why he says in 4 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. All right, I'm going I'm to make this real practical for you, okay? Look at that verse again. Read it like this. Read it personally for you. If God so loved me, I also ought to love, what's his name? What's her name? What's their name? that you don't love. Matter of fact, you have to fight hate in your heart. How would you finish? Who, who is God, what face has God given you? What name has God given you to say that's who you are to love? And here's my hope. This is good news for us to think about it this way. We, we can tend to think, hopefully this would bother you if you hold hatred and unforgiveness in your heart. And, and, and you said what you shouldn't have said. You did what you shouldn't have done. You sent the text. You shouldn't have sent the text. You emailed and you responded online and you shouldn't have done it. And it's out there. And, and a, a true Christian would have in their heart. You might say, what was I thinking? I'm such a terrible Christian. You might say that. Or look what I did. God's going to get me. 
That's not what this is. Here's the different response. When that happens through your life or mine, here's the response you ought to have. What I just said and what I just did and what I'm holding in my heart right now is not who I am. This is not me. God has saved me from me. He's given me and melted me with his love. And I, sh I said it and I shouldn't have said it and I've had this hate and I'm battling with it in my heart. But it's not who I am. See the difference? It makes all the difference where you're just trying to obey commands and trying to keep God from punishing you in your life. No, it's, it's not who I am. I have his spirit. He enables me to love. He loved me first. That's what's to melt your heart. Listen, you probably would never say it out loud like this, but I wonder if this would touch you somehow. This, I thought about this this week. You're not entitled to God loving you. You're not entitled to God saving you. God could hate you, and he would still be worthy of worship because he's God. He created you. He's God. But yet God is love and loves you first and sent his son that wrecked me decades ago on the carpet of my bedroom in Birmingham, Alabama. And I was so moved by this again this week that thought, boy, how could I not love even those that I, I that just hatred creeps up in my heart, but it's not who I am, and it's not who you are. So God can give you this love that you ought to love. He can do it for you with him enabling you and him loving you first. And then finally, how can you love? God's love sets you free to love. Let's watch it. First John 4, 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, that God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him and her. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. So confidence in the day of judgment. Some weird talk from, from John right here toward the end that we all will face judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 2, that it's appointed for us to die, and after that, to face judgment. Romans chapter 14 talks about how we'll give an account. And when we stand before God, how do we have confidence? One, we've, we've, we've believed in Jesus Christ, the true Jesus. Secondly, that we've not lived perfectly, but we've lived repentedly by obeying his commands. And by thirdly, how do we have confidence? We have loved. We have not habitually hated and we've not been perfect, but we've continuously tried to love. Those, that's the confidence we have. And he's saying that that ought to set you free when those are in play, in motion. Set you free then to follow Christ and to be loving. And then he gets real practical. Back in the earlier chapter, he says, we're not to love in speech and in words, but in actions and deeds. So it's real practical love. You don't have to like them, right? But you can... Do practical things to give benefit and give the good. That's what he's after. Because if it's only words and speech, it's imperfect love. We're not growing. In 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We'll land with that. Listen to this. It doesn't say there's no fear in courage. Courage implies fear. He says there's no fear in love. Now think about the difference between those two. Fear and love, that courage and fear go together. Fear and love don't. It's like they repel each other. Here's the closest I could get to trying to bring this some light. So my kids will ask me, like, Dad, are you ever nervous when you preach? And I tell them, yes, I am. I'm, I'm nervous every time. But I've discovered a secret, and I've shared, some of this, I've shared this with some of our pastors when they preach. So when you come out to preach and you're nervous and you got the butterflies and you're jittery, here's the secret. Just love the people. Just love the people. And if you look out there with God's word and you love who is in front of you, love, you dig deep to love, it begins to dissipate that fear. Now apply that to your life because maybe you don't need victory over fear. Maybe you need victory of love. And to look and, 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 and think of it in terms, I just need to love them. I just need to love them. I just need to love them. And watch fear begin to disintegrate. Not, I, I, they may take advantage of me. No, love. Because that's fear again. No, you love. That's what he's saying. 
Whoever fears has not been perfected in God's love. And what was God's love from a couple of weeks ago? John, 80-year-old John said, what love is this that we have been called the children of God? And that language really is, from what country is this love? From what planet is this kind of love? From what land is this kind of love? 80-year-old John saying, because he's not over it. That's the love of God that can set you free, that frees you. 2005, there was a train crash in Los Angeles. 11 people were killed, and there was one man who was dying, thought he would die. So as his, he's bleeding out, so in a latch-ditch effort to give a message, he took his own blood, and he wrote on the back of a train seat, I love my kids. And I thought, that's the cross, man. God came in the form of his son, He died on the cross. His blood poured out to say to you in writing of his blood, I love you. And I love my children. And therefore, you ought to love my children too. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Uh, I I probably needed it more than anybody else under the sound of my voice this weekend. And I'm so grateful for your timing. I'm so grateful for your truth. I am so grateful for your love. That you would send your only son. Thank you for your love that is from another country, from another land, from another planet, from, from eternity. Melt our hearts afresh again. Now, there's many of us in this room and on the sound of my voice at our campuses and online, we do have those shark bites. Some of us even feel like we're bleeding out. But may we see you on that cross, Jesus, that as you were bleeding out, you said, Father, forgive them. What display of love. Melt our hearts again. Jesus, you are worthy and worth it, our lives and our love. I pray, help our unbelief to love as you have loved. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Amen.